Hello, I'm Jim Cross, Chief Financial Officer of Village Missions. Today I want to take you through some basic tax issues for village missionaries serving in the United States. Now, this will not be comprehensive. We could spend hours on this, but there are only a few truly critical things that you need to know. There are also a few trustworthy and reliable free resources that we will point you to, and we recommend that you spend some time learning from those resources. We're going to go over some general information that is relevant to the majority of small church pastors, and it's up to you to apply it in your situation. If you have questions after reviewing the material, I am happy to help you. Just give me a call. Here are the resources that are available to you that we recommend, and we encourage you to become familiar with them. Your first stop should be at Guidestone. Guidestone publishes a tax guide for ministers each year that you can find here at their website. This is highly recommended. There's enough detail here that you can use to prepare your taxes on your own. They also have resources for your church treasurer. So I will provide the link in the comments section below. It's written by Richard Hammer, who is widely acknowledged as an authority on church tax and legal issues, and I refer to him quite a bit. Now, if you would prefer to use a professional preparer, uh, we recommend Jim Rickard and his team at Stewardship Services Foundation. Jim has served many village missionaries over his 40 years of ministry. His ministry prepares thousands of clergy tax returns each year, and it's good to use a professional preparer in years of transition, perhaps your first year in ministry or a year in which you have a major life event, a move between states or kids in college or nearing retirement. Those are all good reasons to consult with a professional preparer. You can reach him through his website, which I will also link below. Another good resource is an IRS publication. They publish uh, Publication 517. It's a comprehensive guide for ministers of the gospel, and it covers just about every conceivable flavor of clergy or religious worker. So I don't recommend that you use this as your primary resource. When reading this, you're going to wade through stuff that may be confusing because it just doesn't apply to you. But it is a good reference, and it also has a good example in the back of a pastor's tax return. Now, I'd like to step through the highlights. These are the critical things that you need to know as a village missionary. First off, Village missionaries are employees. Now, this is often a point of confusion when working with clergy, because when income is earned from providing clergy services, it is subject to self-employment tax. An employing church cannot match and withhold Social Security tax like they would for a regular non-clergy employee like a secretary or a custodian. This unique status leads some to treat ministers as self-employed, but typically that is not the correct treatment. So from publication 517, we read, and let me show this to you. Under common law rules, you are considered either an employee or a self-employed person. Generally, you are an employee if you perform services for someone who has the legal right to control both what you do and how you do it, even if you have considerable discretion and freedom of action. If a congregation employs you and pays you a salary, you are generally a common law employee and income from the exercise of your ministry is wages for income tax purposes. Now, the IRS and the courts have applied various tests to assist in classifying a worker as an employee or self-employed, and here are some of the factors they consider when making the decision. Now, not all of these factors need to be present for a worker to be an employee. Not even a majority need to be present. It's not a balancing test. So it really comes down to direction and control. 
In the case of village missionaries, there's really no question. You are an employee. Another consideration is that tax-free fringe benefits, such as health insurance and uh, life disability retirement are not available to self-employed workers as a tax-free fringe benefit. As a village missionary, you enjoy 100% employer paid health insurance for you and your family. Now, that is a rich benefit that is pretty much unheard of everywhere else these days. Now, you also participate in a retirement plan and the mission makes an annual contribution on your behalf. So those are all good reasons to just embrace the employee status. The W-2 is the correct form for the use of the village missionary. It's been that way for over 30 years. The Tax Reform Act of 1986 made this an issue because of limitations placed on the deduction of employee business expenses. Village missionaries should not receive a 1099 for their service as a village missionary, nor should they use a Schedule C to report that income nor should they match expenses against income on the Schedule C. Now, let me talk about the implications of using Schedule C for a moment. Schedule C is used for sole proprietors who operate a business serving multiple clients or customers. A pastor could properly use a Schedule C for the honoraria that you may receive for the occasional wedding or funeral. That's how it's used in this case. Let me show you a Schedule C, and this is right out of um, Publication 517, uh, where Pastor White has filled out a Schedule C for some honoraria that he has received. This is an example where, yes, you can use it, but only if the income is actually from self-employment. Now, I know that there are pastors who continue to use the Schedule C for their regular church salary, and you've probably escaped scrutiny because of your low income and because the IRS is inadequately equipped to perform their enforcement function. The 2018 tax law has ended the itemized deduction for unreimbursed employee business expenses. So the tactic of recharacterizing business expenses from Schedule A to Schedule C may come in for more scrutiny. The IRS knows that churches are characteristically low compliance, and you may be lulled into a false sense of security because you've been doing it your way for so many years and nothing has ever been said. Again, nothing has ever been said because the IRS has a, a restricted budget. They are having a hard time making ends meet with their enforcement functions, so they go after the big money. But that doesn't mean that they can't come after you. So I want you to beware. If you're not doing it correctly and the IRS happens to find out, the IRS can make it hurt. So. As a village missionary, um, in the context of the employment relationship between the mission and the church and the missionary, use the W-2. Okay. If your church is responsible for issuing a W-2, I recommend that your church treasurer get familiar with this website. It's the um, Social Security Administration Business Services Online. At this site, you can prepare the W-2 free of charge and file it electronically. When you register, Social Security needs to mail you a PIN number, so it takes a few weeks to get this set up so that you can use it. Don't wait till the last minute. It's the government. Nothing is easy. It takes time. Uh, the IRS has also changed the deadline on W-2s. It used to be that you could get the W-2 to your employee by January 31st, and then you could file it with the Social Security Administration by February 28th. And that's no longer the case as of last year. It all needs to be filed and into the Social Security Administration by the end of January. So this is something that you want to start working on right now. 
As a village missionary, you may receive two W-2s, one from the mission and one from the church. The mission will issue a W-2 for any donor paid support plus supplement paid to you. And the church will issue a W-2 for any salary that they're able to pay directly to you. If your church does not pay you a salary consistently, or maybe only pay you a small amount, we encourage them to send the money into Village Missions and let us pay it to you. It's a service we like to offer to your church treasurer because they may be able to escape the burden of quarterly tax filings and W-2 preparation if you're the only employee and they're only paying you once a while. Uh, Sending it to us and letting us take care of it for you could take a huge burden off of your treasurer. And we encourage you to let us take that burden for you because failures in tax uh, payroll tax filing are the number one way that businesses get into trouble with the IRS. Now, let's talk about Social Security tax. Village missionaries are required to participate in Social Security. Generally, clergy may opt out of Social Security based on grounds of conscientious objection. Now, the test for conscientious objection is not whether or not you object to paying tax. Everybody objects to paying taxes. No, the conscientious objection must be to receiving benefits like old age pension, Medicare and Medicaid, or disability or survivor benefits. And honestly, folks, in our current culture, it is rare that anyone could credibly claim conscientious objection. And here's one big reason that we require village missionaries to participate. To borrow a phrase, it's not about you. It's not about you and the big bite the taxes take out of your income or whether or not you think Social Security is going to be there for you when you retire. It's really about those you leave behind. The survivor benefit is a critical piece to have in place. If you die prematurely, your spouse and dependents will receive survivor benefits, which are huge. Uh, as far as you're concerned, there's also the disability piece. You may say, I'm going to preach until the day I die, and you probably will but it may not be as a church pastor. Village missionaries do leave ministry due to health issues from time to time, and you may not be able to earn a living in that capacity. You may not be able to continue as a full-time pastor. So it's very important to have the survivor benefits and the disability, and when it comes to retiring, it's very important to have that, that Medicare and Medicaid in place. Those are big pieces that are very hard to replace privately. And of course, it all comes down to conscientious objection. So we'll talk about how to calculate the social security tax in a moment, but first I'd like to turn the corner and talk about housing allowance and parsonage allowance. Now, housing allowance and parsonage allowance are often used interchangeably the important distinction between them is who owns the home. When you own the home, the church designates a housing allowance, which is the amount of your church salary that may be exempt from income tax to the extent that you use it to pay for housing and related expenses. When the church provides the home, a parsonage allowance can be set aside out of your church salary to pay for housing expenses in the same manner. There are some distinctions for each that I want to highlight. If you own your home, housing allowance is a valuable benefit. You will calculate what you expect to pay for mortgage, interest, taxes, insurance, utilities, maintenance, and other items. The church will approve your housing allowance in advance and then exclude that amount from your W-2 box one gross wages. The amount that you actually spend on housing is then excluded from the income tax calculation, but is added back in when calculating the social security tax, which we will cover in a moment. 
the amount that is excluded for income tax cannot exceed the lowest of the actual amount spent, the amount designated by the church in advance, or the fair rental value of the furnished home plus utilities. The fair rental value will rarely come into play, but you need to be aware of it in years when you're making large outlays for down payments or improvements. We've seen this happen with retirees, for example, who want to go in with a large lump sum for a purchase. If you ever get in a position like that, please do some tax planning before you pull the trigger so that you don't forego a valuable tax benefit. I know that is the one request that all tax preparers, all tax advisors, um, all CPAs and people like me will request of you. It's always do the planning before you pull the trigger. Um, lots, of, lots of sad stories about people who come in on April 15th to the tax preparer and the tax preparer says, has anything changed? And you say, well, nothing's changed. No, but we did we did sell that house or we did we did buy that house or we did do that big thing that we forgot to ask about. So anyway, I digress. Please do the tax planning. Now, parsonage allowance. Parsonage allowance operates exactly the same way that housing allowance does. It excludes what you actually spend on housing for the income tax. Because you're not personally paying the rent and the utilities, the amount that you need to set aside is going to be quite a bit less. And even though you're not paying the rent, you still have plenty of house-related expenses. You probably carry renter's insurance. You probably have personal property insurance on contents, maybe umbrella liability insurance. And there's other things that you, you incur to make your home a nice place to live. Um, if the utilities come out of your pocket, um, you'll want to include those. But oftentimes, parsonage allowance is not a significant benefit because your taxable income may be low already. If you have a few kids, it's likely that your taxable income may already be at zero. And if that's the case, you may decide not to bother with parsonage allowance. And that is perfectly okay. There is one important point about living in a parsonage that is important not to overlook. And that is the fair rental value of the house that you live in is subject to social security tax. We'll talk about that in more detail in a couple of slides, but I wanna highlight it here because the fair rental value can add a significant chunk to your social security tax and it's very important that you do not overlook it. It's easy to overlook, please don't overlook it. So if you need a resource to document your parsonage or housing allowance, ECFA offers a comprehensive worksheet to help you capture all the expenses that qualify for the allowance and I will link it below. Now here's how we calculate the Social Security tax, and this is a table that comes right out of Publication 517. You'll take your salary from box one of the W-2. You'll add the fair rental value of housing plus utilities paid by the church, and then deduct any unreimbursed employee business expenses that you may have paid out of your own pocket. Let's talk about these individual pieces. Fair rental value of housing. Most village missionaries live in parsonages and you need to recognize the value of the parsonage as income for social security purposes. So how do you set the fair value? It can be difficult if you live in a community where the rental market is limited. If market information is not readily available, you can check online at places like census.gov, can drill down to your zip code or your statistical market area. Don't stop there though, because the averages for your larger area may not be representative for your neighborhood. And some factors may lower your estimate, such as the age of the house and the location. Are you in a neighborhood of comparable houses or are you right next door to the church? So 
take all of the relevant factors into consideration and come up with a conservative number that you feel like you can defend. You don't want it to be too high and you don't want it to be too low. You want it to be realistic and on examination, you just want to be able to defend it. Okay, so let's go back to calculating the social security tax. So we're gonna take the fair rental value of the housing and to that we add the amount of utilities paid on your behalf and then deduct any unreimbursed business expenses. Although unreimbursed business expenses have disappeared from itemized deductions, it's likely that their deduction for the social security tax will continue. We have no published guidance for 2018 as of the date of this recording, but we will let you know if things change. Our position on business expenses is that the church should be reimbursing you for your activities related to ministry as a part of the budget, and it should not be a part of the salary package. That's not always possible in a church with a tight budget, so if you are out of pocket, make sure that you're deducting those expenses to calculate the Social Security tax. As I mentioned earlier, you are responsible for making your own tax payments. Taxes need to be paid in throughout the year as you earn the income. This is not something you can take care of at the end of the year in one lump sum, and it's not something that you can afford to get behind on. There are penalties for late payment and underpayment. In addition, there is interest to be paid on late payments, and once you get behind, it is hard to get back on top of it. So here's the general rule. In most cases, you must pay estimated tax if both of the following apply. Do you expect to owe at least $1,000 in tax after subtracting your withholding and refundable credits? Do you expect your withholding and refundable credits to be less than the smaller of uh, A, 90% of the tax to be shown on this year's tax return, or B, 100% of the tax shown on last year's tax return? If so, you need to make sure that you have your estimated taxes paid in. There is an exception. You don't have to pay estimated tax for the current year if you had no tax liability for the full 12 month tax year prior. If you had no tax liability in the prior year, if your total tax was zero, or if you didn't have to file an income tax return, the benefit of the exception is that it will help you avoid penalties and interest. But please don't use the exception to delay making your estimated payments. Form 1040 ES provides all the worksheets that you need to estimate your tax liability for both income and Social Security taxes. Remember, this is an important point, remember that the income tax and the social security tax are calculated differently. The income tax does not include housing allowance or fair rental value of parsonage, but the social security tax does. For the income tax, you'll typically use your cash salary, that's the amount that you would expect to see in W-2 box one. And for the social security tax, you need to take that W-2 box one and also add housing allowance and the fair rental value of the parsonage and utilities if applicable. You can use the table from publication 517 that I showed you earlier. Once you have arrived at your estimate, you can use the coupons in Form 1040 ES to mail in your payments. And here are the dates by which you need to make your payments. April, June, September, in January. Alternatively, and this is important, alternatively, you can ask Village Missions to withhold your estimate from your monthly pay. We are happy to do that, and it makes it a whole lot easier for you to budget. So, that's our Missionary Tax Primer. There's a lot to know, which you can pick up from some of the resources that we have linked below. 
If you have questions, please call me or send an email. I would like to get your questions so that I know what's on your mind and what issues we need to address in future videos. So thank you for being with me and I look forward to hearing from you.